Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to 24 Hours of PATH, the evolution of the data platform. We're excited you could join us today for Stacia Vargas' session, A Gentle Introduction to Data Analytics in SQL Server 2016. 24 Hours of PATH consists of 24 consecutive live webcasts delivered by expert speakers from the PATH community. All the sessions are being recorded and they will be posted online after the event. It usually takes less than a week. And to access any of the on-demand sessions, just visit www.24hoursofpast.com for all the session links. My name is Angela Henry and I will be your moderator today. I have a few introductory slides before I hand the reins over to Stacia. Um, Stacia, if we could go to the next slide. So if you do need technical assistance, just type your question into the question pane located on the right side of your screen and someone will assist you. Um, the question pane is also where you're going to ask any questions throughout the presentation. So feel free to enter your questions at any time, um, but we will do the Q&A at the end of the session. So um, I will be reading the questions aloud and have Stacia answer those for you. Um, if you need to, you can zoom into the presentation um, content by using the zoom button located at the top of your presentation window. Um, and we are going to have a short evaluation at the end of the session, and we really need your feedback on this. So please take time to complete it, and it's going to show up in your web browser. All right, sponsors. We could not not have 24 hours of pass without the sponsors. They are what makes this possible for the attendees. Their generous support allows us to provide this free of charge for all the attendees. So huge thank you goes out to Microsoft, Hortonworks, Amazon, Redgate, Hewlett Packard, SQL Century, and SanDisk. Thank you very, very much. And our next slide, um, pass. PASS is who is actually presenting this. Um, we have lots of things out there for you. Um, just go on out, head to our web website. You can join a local user group all around the world. We have special interest groups, virtual chapters, free online resources, um, and you can catch up on all the community news in our connector newsletter. And our next slide is Ms. Stacia Varga, formerly known as Stacia Meisner, and I am going to turn this over to Stacia and let her begin. Thank you so much, Angela. Well, welcome everyone from sunny Las Vegas, a very early sunny Las Vegas. This is session number two of 24 Hours of Pass, a general introduction to data analytics in SQL Server 2016, and actually a little bit beyond that. I'll include some other aspects of the data platform. Now, SQL Server 2016 is officially released next week and it includes both new and old features to support data analytics and that's just one part of our Microsoft data platform stack that includes tools that support data analytics and we're going to look at several options that you have but first what exactly is data analytics and how does it differ from traditional business intelligence or data science I'll start with some thoughts about these terms and then and I'm going to show you how to use the Microsoft stack to support some of our data analytics projects. And more specifically, I'll show you how you might start a data analytics project by using data visualizations to explore your data. Now, there's lots more things that we could do, but we only have a little less than an hour to get through that. So I'm going to be focused more on exploratory analytics today. But first, let's get started with some definitions. Now, one definition of data analytics comes from Gartner, and it's a fairly long definition, but several key things jump out at me. For one, they call it a catch-all term, which explains why it means different things to different people, but it can be as simple as analysis of information from a specific subject matter or from a specific part of your business. And it's something that BI vendors are tossing out more frequently to get attention for their products, which does not help reduce confusion. Now, according to Gartner, the more common usage these days is that analytics involves statistics and math, and it can be descriptive or predictive, which reminds me a lot of the way that we used to describe data mining 15 years ago. And it's used to analyze data that your business generates and possibly combining that data that you get from outside of the company, whether you get that for free or pay for that. 
Then we have a definition of BI, which I got from Forrester, and this one looks familiar to me as a longtime BI consultant and educator. Essentially, it is also a catch-all term for technologies and techniques that we use to transform our raw data from business processes into information in one way or another. Whereas the instructors of a data science course, one of whom teaches at MIT uh, Sloan School of Management, has this definition for data science in which both exploration and analysis occur. But it typically includes both structured and unstructured data. Now I find that data science is one of the those things. It's an evolving subject without definition, but most in the field agree that it requires a broader range of skills than we might find of just pure data analytics, which is highly statistical, or business intelligence, which gets involved in some of the reporting side and some of the more uh, technology and data movement types of activities. Whereas data science probably encompasses all of that. For me, it's easier to compare and contrast these terms by thinking about the kinds of questions that I ask. For example, analytics allows me to understand the structure of the data. I can count things. I can understand how the data is distributed by looking at mins and maxes and means and medians. I can learn about variation in the data and I can uncover relationships between the variables. And these are activities that I would typically perform as I'm getting familiar with a new data set and I'm preparing to do something such as a data mining or a machine learning project. But these are not necessarily questions that I would package up and deliver to business users in a report on a regular basis. I want to talk about just a couple of these things that you may have heard these terms and may not be familiar with. So this is where the gentle introduction comes in today. Um, distribution and variation are really key things to understand about our data when we're working on these analytics or data science projects. So uh, the center of variation, this is mean and median. Mean would be our average. We take the number of objects that we have and we uh, uh, we take the, the total of these, some number that we're using, and dividing it by the number of objects that we have, and that comes up with our, our average or our mean. And the problem with means is that they can get distorted by outliers. We could have a lot of values that are in the normal range, and we could have one big giant outlier, and our, it skews the mean. Whereas a median is another calculation that we can have that figures out where the line is, where we have half of our values above the line and half of our values below the line. And when we're looking at our data, we really need to look at both of these numbers, both the mean and the median, because if our data is not skewed, if we don't have a lot of outliers, the mean and median are going to be pretty close. So that gives us some information just by comparing those two things. Whereas if I see a difference between them, then I can decide, is this distribution skewed? Do I have some outliers pushing uh, the mean uh, one direction or another? Whereas variance and standard deviation tell us a, a bit about how far our values will uh, stray from this uh, from the, this middle, if you will. So think about. Um, uh, heights of American men. The average or mean height, according to somebody, says it's 5 foot 10 inches tall. And there's a standard deviation of 3 inches. So what that means is most men are going to be within 3 inches of 5 foot 10, whether they're at the low end at 5 foot 7 or at the high end of um, 6 foot 1. So somewhere in there, the majority of the population is going to fit within that. So that's what the standard deviation says is where is the bulk of our uh, population expected to be in our data. Then um, now two standard deviations would be six inches. So we could have some men that um, are are from six inches shorter, so five foot four, or uh, six inches taller, so that gets us up into the five, six foot five range. So there will be people in that population, it's just not as many that we would expect to find in this one standard deviation above or below. So think about a bell curve where we see fewer numbers as we get farther away from our mean. And the variance defines how far we get in either direction. So we look at those kind of two numbers together, and, and three standard deviations would be exceptionally uh, unusual. 
in that case. So that's, those four numbers are things that we want to look at regularly when we're analyzing our data. But these aren't things that I would necessarily report to the business to say, hey, here's how your business is doing. These are more things that we look at to try to understand the structure of our data and understand do we have outliers, does that, this mean that um, maybe we have some dirty data. Whereas business intelligence, I think, uh, is more about the questions that I would package up. These are the questions that the business asks over and over again, where we summarize the data for defined periods of time, and we typically compare at one point in time to another point in time to find the good or the bad trends. And BI becomes even more powerful when we can combine data from multiple sources and get a more complete view of our business. So BI tends to help us see what happened in the past and what's happening in the present. Now here's another way to compare analytics with BI. The two technologies really coexist as complementary components of our data platform. Now a BI system can exist without analytics and analytics can exist without our BI system, but together the analytics tool can reveal the right combination of variables to look at and the BI tool can be used to discover the impact of this knowledge. BI is really assumption driven. The business user has educated guesses about the questions to ask. So let's say that you are in the insurance business and you know that a male driver with a valid license over 25 is a better insurance risk than a younger driver. And you might use a BI tool to identify all of the people in your customer base that meet this criteria so that you can set up a targeted mail campaign. And you take a drill down approach and start with your whole population of customers and start filtering it down to the, get to this particular group. But what is it that makes this older male driver a good insurance risk? That, that's where analytics might confirm the things that we already think we know, the age and the valid license, but it might find that a good credit history is just as important as those other things. So now the mailing list can be targeted to a more desirable audience and you could offer a special rate to beat the competition. So another way I like to think about this is that BI tends to be record oriented. We try to come down from the top and drill down into specific details, but the analytics operations are more variable oriented and we're coming up from the bottom of the information trying to find the patterns that are out there. And then we have data science. And here's a set of questions that one of the Microsoft data scientists uses to explain what data science can do. So we have things like how much and how many, and these use regression algorithms to answer those questions. What will the temperature be? How many products are we going to sell? Or which category can we put something in? This is a classification algorithm. Is this picture a cat or a dog? Or what's the topic of this news article? Or we might try to figure out what group things belong into. This would be clustering algorithms or recommend recommendation engines. Which of our shoppers buy the same things? Which people like the same movies? And some groups make more sense than others, so this can be more of an art than a science. Uh, something weird. This is anomaly detection. Is this instrument giving us a normal reading or an unusual reading? How do we know? Or fraud detection. Do we think that some kind of purchase has happened that's atypical of what this customer does in the past? Um, or what action do we want to take? Should I raise or lower the temperature? Or I'm coming up to a yellow light. Should I brake or accelerate? Things like this. So this reminds me a lot of the same things we were doing in data mining years ago, but the technologies that we have now to perform this type of learning from our data can work with bigger data sets and different structures. In some ways it overlaps with analytics, but I think it goes farther and it's largely predictive rather than descriptive, but there's always exceptions. Now, I've heard people say that data science is about the future. What actions can you take? In some ways, I feel that BI was always supposed to be about driving action, but it didn't necessarily provide you with the information about how. It cannot tell you, I mean, well, it can tell you that a situation is trending in a positive or a negative direction, but it doesn't necessarily tell you why. Whereas analytics and data science, they dig into that why. They each try to uncover the variables and the patterns in the data that lead to those positive or negative outcomes, but in slightly different ways.
And at the end of the day, the most important thing is to understand what you want to accomplish and then choose the tools and the data to help you get that done. So today, we only have a little time available, so I'd like to talk about your options in the Microsoft Stack for just getting started with analytical projects, primarily focused on getting familiar with your data before you tackle a bigger project. So I'm going to walk you through some of the things we can do with various components in the Microsoft Stack. We'll look at Excel and the Power BI components within Excel or Power BI Desktop specifically. And then new to SQL Server 2016 is our services. We also have SQL Server Analysis Services Data Mining, which has been around since SQL Server 2000, but don't let age dissuade you, it is still a powerful tool. And last, we'll take a quick peek at Azure Machine Learning. Now, regardless of which tool you plan to use, you need to start by correctly organizing your data. It's usually, in these kinds of projects, best to create a single table and then think about the variables that you might include. And we have different kinds of variables. We have categorical variables. And this includes descriptions like gender and race and nationality. And this type of variable, even if it's numeric, has no arithmetic meaning. That is, you cannot use it to calculate your means or your medians. Now, another type of variable is quantitative or numerical, and this is the category that includes values like age and weight and height, and these are the numbers that you can average or sum or use to find deviations. Now, values can be continuous, such as a range of ages or salaries, or they can be discrete. Maybe you have a limited range of values, such as a response to a survey ranging from 1 to 5. And a third type of variable is ordinal. This category includes data like education level or hour of the day. In this case, order matters, but we don't average those numeric values. Now, one way that I like to compare tools for analytics and data mining is to use the bike buyer's view from AdventureWorks Data Warehouse. And it's really good for describing data and also for testing out predictive models. And it combines data from our fictitious company, AdventureWorks, about the various customers and some of the demographics, and uh, also the purchase history, whether or not the customer ever bought a bike from AdventureWorks. Now, it includes other data in here that we wouldn't necessarily use for analytics. We have things like uh, a name and an address and phone number. And these are not data points that we typically use for analytics, but they're in here to be used for reporting later. And then we have data that we do want to use for analytics, such as core categorical and ordinal data. We have marital status and gender and education and occupation and commute distance, that's our ordinal data, and region. And we have quantitative values such as income and total children and number of children at home, house owner flag, and the number of cars owned, and age. We also have a value to predict, bike buyer, which isn't always required for an analytics project, or we could just use it just simply as a piece of information here. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that we're predicting, but it does give us additional information about this group of customers. So, one of the first things that you might want to do with your data is to explore it. And there's lots of different ways to do this, but a super easy way to get started is with Power BI. And you can do this in Excel or in Power BI Desktop. So this is an example. We'll, we'll look at this a little more closely if it's hard to see for you there. But for each column that we return in our query there, we can come up with the average, the mean. We have a total count, distinct counts, max and min, uh, null counts, how many records have an empty value for a particular column, and also standard deviation. So we can do this in our Power Query or our Get Data functions, depending on what version of Excel you're using, or within Power BI, we have this Get Data feature. And the key to this uh, ability to get this information is a function called table.profile. Now you could put in this formula in the advanced editor, but that's a lot of things to type out. And I don't like to type things anymore than I have to. So let me show you a different way to put this in. So I'm going to switch over now over into Excel. And as I mentioned earlier, this is something you could also do in Power BI if you use the, the get data function uh, in there. 
I'm using Excel 2013 here, so I have to go to the Power Query tab and choose from database. If you have Excel 2016, you would just go to the data tab and there's a get data feature in there. But once we get to this point of selecting where the data is coming from, it works uh, pretty much the same way. So I want to point to my SQL Server database and we'll point to the server and I will also put in the name of the database. Now, this is under the covers AdventureWorks DW 2014, but I've renamed my stuff to just AdventureWorks DW because it's all pretty much the same for the purposes we need. And it's going to go out and find all of the tables and views, and the one that I want here is the vTarget mail. And it will show me the preview of some of the data here so that I can confirm this is what I want. And I'm going to choose the edit option here so I can go in and make changes to this query so that I can use this table.profile function. Now, off to the right here in the query settings, there's these steps. So initially, we pointed to a server in a particular database, so we see all of the tables, and then because I selected a specific view, then there's this navigation step that actually zeroes in on uh, the, the, that particular uh, rows and columns of that view, but I don't want that. I actually want the table object, so I'm going to eliminate that navigation. There's this little X that I um, selected there to remove that step, so now I can go find that vTarget mail and actually just filter this. So I'm selecting all of the rows that equal vTarget mail, which that's the only one that's in there, so that's what I'm left with. And what we get is this data column that has a table in it, and that's why I backed up and focused on this particular version of the steps of retrieving data, because I want to apply a custom column here to do a profile of the data in this particular table. So I'm going to add a custom column and we'll give this column a name. I'll call this profile. And then in the formula, I'll type in table.profile and then open parentheses, reference that column, the one right up here that's got this table in it. And now when I click OK, what that does is it adds another column that also has a table object in it, but I can expand this out now, and it shows me all of the data that it has read for the rows that are in this data table over here. So I get column, min, max, average, standard deviation, count, null count, distinct count, and so on. I'm going to remove this prefix just so I just get these names of the columns without the word profile in front of it. So I'll just click OK and it uh, blows out this table. We can see these various column names, and I can just eliminate these initial columns here so that I'm left with only this column in max, average, standard deviation, and so on. So now I can view my data. I have a query, and that all of these steps here is just the, the user interface version of that formula that I showed you in the slide. But now I can look at my data, and I can see uh, all of the various things, like for age as an example, I can see the min and the max, the average, standard deviation, and so on. So uh, we'll talk a little bit later about specific things that I'm looking for. Right now I just want to show you the various tools that we have for getting at this base information. Now, uh, one of the things that I had pointed out is the mean and the median. We have average here for mean, but this doesn't give us median information. But I can get DAX functions that I can build out to enhance this information, and uh, I could also get variance in there uh, if I like. But more often than not, standard deviation is the, the value that we're looking for. So this is a quick way to get this information inside of Power BI. And we can do similar things with R, the new analytics feature inside of SQL Server 2016. So one way to get at this information is to use an Rx summary function. And um, so this, there's a few things that we need to do to line up uh, our services in here, but um, that's what I'm going to show you how to do next. So I have RStudio loaded. This is uh, a free client tool for working with R, 
And you could use um, R for or t uh, R tools for Visual Studio. Uh, I'm starting to think of the name of it, or any R client. The process is really the same. The thing is, you just need to have the R services installed on your workstation, um, and then uh, you know if you're connecting to a remote SQL server, I have everything installed locally here. So all of the libraries and packages and everything that are R specific to SQL Server are uh, installed locally. So uh, here we have, um, up in the top left, if you're not familiar with this, I have where I have my various commands that I can execute. And depending on what I'm doing, we'll see other things happen on our screen. So I've installed uh, our services in SQL Server. And there are some specific functions that get uh, loaded in here. There's a Revo Scale R package. So Microsoft purchased this. And um, if you want to learn about what functions are available in here, you just type in the word help and then whatever package you're interested in. If you highlight this and click run, oh, this is not some This worked for me yesterday. OK, well, let's back up here and just see what else isn't going to work for me. So I have some variables here. This is one of the things that we have um, in ours. We define some string value. And we have a variable assignment here. And I want to make a connection to my Adventure Works data warehouse. And I'm using a Windows connection here. So it has Windows trusted connection is true. Let's see. This works so far. So what happens is I've defined a variable and I've assigned a value to it. And it shows up in the global uh, environment off to the right here. And I have um, a, another variable called SQL Byte Buyer View that I do the same thing. And it also just assigns the name of this view. And I can select multiple things at once. I don't have to do them one by one by one here. But essentially what we're doing is we're building something called a data set. Data set these uh, variables that we can create can be string data, they can be numeric data like we have here, or various objects. R has this concept of data sets. And so one of the functions that we have with our R services is uh, this Rx SQL Server data. So this is saying go and uh, use this connection string and get this view and read in, for performance reasons, you might read in some of the data at once. But we're basically going to go and read this data in. And it is not working. Huh. This is not good because, like I said, this was just working yesterday. So I'm trying to think, what, um, what did I do? All that I did was close this down and open it back up again. So. So I can't show you things, so I don't want to spend too much time trying to diagnose this. But we'll walk through the code and say what's going, what should happen here. So what should happen is we read in this data. And then one of the things about our services, what makes it special is uh, in SQL Server is that we can operate in database. And the, um, the traditionally what's happened with R is that you've had to do these things, uh, run these R operations to analyze your data on your local machine. And it will um, have some limitations. You know, most of us don't run around with server quality machines. And so you have a limitation in the amount of memory that you can hold, which limits the, the volume of the data, the number of records, and the number of columns that you could be operating against. So by having the R services um, running in database, then what you're able to do is do something called set the compute context so that the R operations, anything that it's aggregated or computing on actually runs inside of SQL Server. So I have a, a set of um, commands here or, or variables that get set up to define uh, a shared folder on, on my machine that is a place basically between the local client and the server to exchange some information. And then we use this Rx in SQL Server function to uh, assign the connection string, tell it where the shared directory is, tell it uh, whether it's waiting for the R operations to complete or not, and whether or not we're outputting things to the uh, console. So we're assigning the results of this function to this object called CC, and then we're passing that in to Rx set compute 
context you see. So this is really all of the things that we need to do to tell SQL Server to be ready to run those R operations. And then we could explore the data. So one way to explore the data is to use an Rx get var info, and we would pass in that data source that we had defined, and it would list out variables and tell us what the data types are, if it's numeric or string data. But then the thing that I have on the slide an example of is the Rx summary. And in order for that to work on your SQL Server machine, you actually need to do some things to enable the external scripts. So you need to run SP configure, external scripts enabled, you need to run reconfigure, and then you need to restart the SQL Server in order for those things to work. And then you would run this Rx summary. And so there's um, some syntax here where we tell it what we want. And this uh, syntax with the tilde and a dot says, tell me about every column that's in that data source, and the data source we define here. And that's fine, but there's some information that doesn't come out uh, very nicely when we just tell it the information with this simple little formula. So what I like to do is change my data source to point to uh, the particular view itself, that's what we had before, but I add in this one argument called string as factors equals true, and that's what gets us this information. If I can go back to the slide, we actually see this is what the result would be. And um, we have uh, things like any numeric values. We have means and standard deviations, min, max. And then for the things that are categorical, marital status, gender, and so on, we would see what the categories are and uh, what for each individual value for marital status, we can see that there's an M and an S. And we can see the population count for each of those. So that's one way to use Rx summary. Um, sometimes your view might be a little noisy, so you could just uh, set up a, a select statement here and assign this to a variable, and then with uh, passing in a query as opposed to pointing to a table, you can then uh, reset what's assigned to your data set, and again, uh, do your Rx summary. Instead of looking at all of your columns, you could look at a specific column just by using the tilde and then the name of the column that you want to look at. Or you can look at combinations. I could look at for each region, which would be like Pacific or North America and Europe, I could look at the commute distance for each one of those individually. So uh, again, if uh, this were working, we could see with the, with the help function, we could see all of the the different functions that are available in this package, and Rx summary is just one of many different things that we can do in here. So, uh, other things that we might be able to do is to work with analysis services, and this is an example of a clustering algorithm. So, if we go out to Visual Studio that has um, SQL Server data tools, actually, is what's installed here. And we have um, a, a project that I've set up here, just to kind of show you how I got here, is I did file new project, and then there's an analysis services multidimensional and data mining. So you have to have this instance installed. You create a new project, and when you do this, you have to create a data source. And the data source just says, um, here's where my data is. It's the standard connection, my server, and my database. And then we set up a data source view. And you do this just by right-clicking on the folder. And you have new data source and new data source view. In my data source view, I point to a particular um, view. So this is that vTarget mail. So I'm using the same source in a variety of different ways. And then what I would do is create a new mining structure. And there's lots of different data mining algorithms that are built in. One of the things that it asks us here is um, where's your data? Is it in a database or in a cube? In this case, this is just uh, from the database. And then we choose which data mining technique do you want to use. And there's several that are built in. This is an extensible platform, so we could add in third-party data mining algorithms here. Um, I'm going to use clustering because that gives me a nice description 
descriptive uh, view of my data, you'd click next, you'd point to the data source view that you have, and then it wants to know what's the structure of this table. And most of the time, you're going to be working with a case table. And a case table just means everything's in one table as compared to a nested table, which is, uh, think about like sales order header and sales order detail, where I might have a header and a detail um, combination of tables. That would be nested. So most of the time we use case, and then it shows me all of the columns that are in here, and I need to identify what's the key column, in other words, the column that uniquely identifies each record or case in the model, and then I tell it what I want it to analyze. So I don't need to analyze things like address and address line. Remember, those are, are things that are used for reporting purposes, but I want to identify my categorical uh, and my numerical variables in here like age and bike buyer. Um, birth date isn't really necessary because it's really similar to age. They tell us the same things except that age is something that I can calculate um, means and medians and standard deviations and so forth. Um, commute distance, I have uh, education and gender and let's see, house owner flag and marital status and number of cars and number of children and region and so forth. And some of these things might be useful and some of them not. So uh, this is where I'm taking kind of my, my best guess at what I think might be useful in terms of variables for determining in my customer groups what I, what I really want to understand is what is the difference between people who are bike buyers and not bike buyers because AdventureWorks sells bikes so we want to attract more of those kinds of customers that are buying bikes from us. So when I select those columns, then it wants to know whether something is a continuous value or a discrete value. So continuous would be those things that where there's a lot of distinct values is one way to think of that. It's a, it's a large range. Whereas bike buyer, there's really only two values. There's a, a zero and a one. So I would call this a discrete um, content, and um, most of the other things will leave it continuous, um, although we could argue that number of cars owned is discrete because it's not a huge number or the number of children at home, but I want to show you what the difference is when we leave it one way versus the other. So when I finish this, then it becomes a, um, a mining structure and a mining model. I'm just going to give this a name here and save it. And normally what you would do at this point is you would process this, but this might take a few minutes, so I'm just in the interest of time. I have a mining model that I've already created and processed here using that same uh, set of steps that I just showed for you. So what we have is clustering. And in clustering, what we get, get a little bit of... Uh, things out of line here, is um, cluster profile. So we see our entire population, and then we have individual clusters that have some number of customers assigned to them. So you can see they're sort of evenly balanced, but not necessarily. That's not the reason why things get assigned to clusters, is to have the even number of customers in each one. But rather, each cluster represents um, a group of customers that are most like each other and most unlike customers in other uh, clusters. And we can look at this and it kind of tells a story about the people in uh, each population. So as I look at the individual clusters, I can point at data. There's an, a legend off to the right here. So this shows me, um, for example, my, my means, my standard deviations, my maximums. And I could look at this for uh, various data. So here's my continuous data. Notice how it's structured as kind of the sliding scale. So we can see that it's a much wider range, see the larger diamond, as opposed to cluster 2, which has has a very narrow range by comparison. So that's what our continuous variables look like, as opposed to um, bike buyer where I have discrete. So if I look at my entire population, one of the things I can see my distribution is it's fairly evenly balanced. I have an even mix of bike buy buyers versus non-bike buyers, and that's pretty good. I don't have skewed data there. Um, or gender, I have a pretty even mix of male and female. 
And so that's very desirable when we can balance out our data here to, to get an even mix to try to figure out what are the variables that make somebody more likely to buy a bike as opposed to not. And so each cluster has some kind of bit of information. We can see some people, one cluster has more non-homeowners, whereas another cluster has more um, homeowners. But there's just things that we can learn about this and discover uh, about our data and, um, and get into this. So we don't have all of the same kinds of information that we get from our other tools, um, but we but there's just things that are kind of complementary here, and it's another way to start exploring your data. And I mentioned earlier, when you start looking at your data, there are some things that you might want to look for, and especially indicators of data quality issues. So first thing would be looking at missing values relative to the total number of rows in your data. Or look at what's reasonable for the mins and the maxes and means and also look for values that look invalid and for the outliers as well. Look at data ranges that might be too narrow or too wide. Now if we look at the visualizations for analytics, these visualizations can also be very helpful as a tool for exploring your data. And so to help understand your data before you start building out predictive models, you can use visualizations that help you see distribution and relationships. And I'll show you examples of this in just a few minutes. And also, you again, you want to look out for your data quality issues that might pop out. You're looking at the ranges of values for a variable and also for areas where your values might be missing. So, we have um, distribution. This is where we can look at a simple count of variables. Some things to look for include looking for the peak value of a distribution. Where is it the highest? And how many peaks are in the distribution? This is known as a unimodal distribution when it has a single peak versus a bimodal distribution when it has a double peak. So all I've done here is taken um, my customers. I have something called an age bucket, and we'll talk about how I got that uh, in just a moment. But I've taken my customers, and if I put them into age buckets and done a simple count. And we're just looking for variation in the data. Is it concentrated in certain intervals or a particular category? Um, in the bottom example, I'm looking at customers, uh, but this time counting them by yearly income. And I don't have buckets, it's just more of a continuous distribution there. Now, speaking of distributions, another way to understand distributions is by using a histogram. So if the R services were working properly, we have an Rx histogram function, and we could feed in a variable. In this case, I've used age, and um, we tell it what data source we want to use. We could add in a title, and there's lots of different arguments that you can pass in, and there's a lot of flexibility in R. That's what makes it so popular. And we could have just stopped there without the fourth argument in there, and we would see a lot of age buckets that it would figure out very um, uh, noisy kind of distribution. So we can um, narrow you know, the number of options down by adding in this num breaks to um, give us, it sort of figures out what the number or what the range of, should be for each bucket. So you have that function to explore your data. And incidentally, your R functions work inside of Power BI as well. I'll show you um, how to get that set up. Shortly, so we have um, histograms in Power BI, and there's a, several different ways that we can do this. So just we'll, we'll quickly, I'll just say in the slides, we could build it into the model itself or in the get data section. So let's just pop over into Power BI here, and let me show you um, the different ways that I have this set up. So in my uh, model itself, I have my target uh, mail that I've brought in as a table. And what I have is I've added in a calculated column here with that formula that's on the slide. You can do download those later to take a closer look. But it's basically saying I've got this, um, this age bucket that I've created uh, just manually. We'll take a look at this. I've just created a manual table that, because uh, you can enter in data here, just created some age buckets with start and end. And then with my customers, uh, I've got this calculated column that compares each individual 
customer and says, okay, what's your age, and then what bucket does that go into, just using this formula. Now, another way that we could do things is to use our get data function and point to the vTarget mail. So I'm just going to show you two different ways that you could do this. Option one would be to point to our vTarget mail, same place we, we started with this before, and then use the group rows. This is on the transform tab. And you can do, do a group by function here. So I click this little gear, you can actually see what the user interface looks like. We just tell it, group by age, and then make a new column called age count, and count the rows that are in there. So we're not really making buckets here, we're just saying for each individual age, how many people are in there, and then that gives us um, a very uh, wide um, uh, histogram that we can build. Another option would be to point to that same source, and this time we add in a um, a very long conditional expression where we basically look at each age and then manufacture what bucket it goes into. And then we do a group by on uh, this, just grouping by age bucket and then counting the rows that go in there. So different ways, there's no one right way or wrong way here, but the difference is, is um, how many buckets do we get? If we look in a report, here I've got examples of each one. So the top one here, we see the distribution is a very wide chart because each individual age is represented, whereas the bottom chart here is the smaller number of buckets. Um, we can see um, just a slightly different uh, kind of distribution of our data here. So that's histograms. And then uh, another thing that I want to show you is in our Azure Machine Learning, we also get histograms. So most of the steps in an experiment give you this information. We can see the mean and the median, the min, max, standard deviation, and so forth. So if you're doing a machine learning sorts of things, I have an experiment opened up here in Azure Machine Learning Studio. So I've basically, in this case, I put uh, the target mail data out to a CSV file and then brought it in for whatever reason I had at the time. But any step that you have as you add um, steps into your experiment here, if you point to it and go to data set, you can visualize the data and see what's going on. So on a column by column basis, we'll get the, um, the information that we saw on that slide and it is pausing here, here we go. So some things it doesn't really make sense, like customer key, if I point to that, having mean and median doesn't make sense here, but if we scroll through the data, and we can find things like gender and marital status where we can see a histogram of the data. So again, it's just a real quick, easy way to get some statistical information and start understanding the contents of the data that we have so we can say, do we have the right distribution? Do we have some odd data in there that needs to be cleaned up? Too many outliers? Or can I go and enhance this data, get in some more uh, information that might give me a better uh, distribution for whatever kind of modeling project that I'm going to do? Other ways that we might want to look at data. So that was for continuous variables. We could also look at um, discrete data in column or bar charts. So here's four different ways of looking at our data, the various variables, the marital status, gender, homeowner flag, and commute distance. And so we would look for the proper representation in, in each variable if you think it's going to be a predictor. For example, male and female here in the top right are almost evenly balanced. We saw that in the, um, the data mining clustering. And you don't want data that's skewed heavily one way or another, but of course if that's what you have, that's what you have, but you should be aware of it in any event. If you're going to use scatter plots, uh, you need two continuous variables. And so I found when I looked at this where we have age on the x-axis and income on the y-axis, it looks a little strange because it's all striated there, but that's because we have bucketed income. We don't have a true um, continuous range of yearly income in this particular data set. But um, what we're looking for when we do have a scatter plot is looking for a relationship between the two inputs. And if there's a relationship, what you'll see is kind of a line around which um, the dots will cluster. So in this 
Smith's case, there does not look to be a very strong relationship between income and age. Younger people and older people are represented across most of the income levels. But what does stand out here is a potential outlier here um, where we see somebody's age is nearing 100 years old. So then I would look at that and decide um, is that something that is going to skew some kind of modeling project later. Other things we might do with categorical variables, you could set them up in a clustered column chart like this, but this can be hard to compare because your eye has to jump back and forth uh, to the legend to sort out what's what in each individual cluster. So instead, you might use side-by-side -side comparisons like this when one of your variables has only two possible values. Um, white buyer has zero and one, so this is a great example of doing a side-by-side -side comparison. Or you could do the same thing um, as a stocked, stacked column chart to look at relative frequencies along the x-axis. So again, this is good if your variable is binary, only two values. If you start getting more than that, it's very difficult to really assess what percentage of this bar any particular variable value is. Otherwise, if you have more than um, two possibilities for a variable, then use multiples. So here we're taking along the bottom, you can see the uh, professions, clerical management, manual, and so forth, but each quadrant represents a different commute distance. So we can see the difference um, within each grouping and it makes it a lot easier to compare within each uh, commute distance, how the occupations will vary and what the distribution of the, the data is. Now, in these cases, I used Power BI to put this information together, but reporting services also supports these charts, and you can also use R. Oh, I was going to tell you about using R inside of Power BI over here. Um, let's jump over to Power BI. There is something that you need to do extra in here, and that is to go to uh, File, Options, and then uh, in your, come on, options, there's an R scripting where you would uh, point to your R home directory. And if you don't know where that is or you need to install R, and this would be your client side R uh, libraries, then there's a link here that will take you to a page where you can download that stuff and then see where that is. So that's how you can get R installed. And then inside of Power BI, you actually can do um, R types of things. So here I have a, a box plot visualization, for example, which is another great way to kind of look at distributions. So we can see the median and we can see kind of outliers up here. We can see how this is distributed. But basically, um, when you do the R scripting, you get this R visualization in your visualization pane, and then you get this R script editor. So here's where I'm able to use some things like ggplot2 to come up with a box plot, but ggplot comes up with lots of different ways to visualize your data to enhance and extend what, uh, what you already have built in. So I think we're running down on time here, and uh, so let's get back to the slides, and now it's time for questions. Great. Well, we do have a few questions for you, Stacia. Uh, first one is, do you recommend any books, blogs, courses to get into data analytics? This person is a DBA, and they want to see if data science is for them. Well, gosh, I'm still working my way through a lot of books, so it's hard to say which which one. I really like, there's a book called Naked Statistics, which is just awesome. Um, the guy really does a good job of, um, it's uh, Charles Whelan, and um, he does a really, really good job of of explaining statistics in a meaningful way. Um, in terms of blogs, the one that jumps out to me um, most is Buck Woody. I don't can't think of the name. I want to say something like a backyard data scientist or something like that. But Buck Woody has been doing a lot of blogging in the data science space and analytics sorts of things. So those are the two that I can think of off of the top of my head. Um, but that would be. Um, something I probably should like blog about or something to come up with a more finite list than I can off the top of my head. So sorry I can't think of more, but those are the two that jump. Um, oh, some other resources. edX, EDX has a bunch of, sort of, of courses that get into analytics and data science and also uh, Coursera. Uh, are some other resources where they're always running courses in these subject areas. And they're free, which makes them really great, really good content. 
All right, great. Um, next question. Oh, can you make your R scripts available for the audience? I can. So I'll tell you what I'll do is uh, my blog is blog.datainspirations.com and I will do up a blog on why my environment failed today and what should have happened <laughs> with screenshots <laughs> and everything because I don't know what happened there. But blog.datainspirations.com and I'll get that up probably not until this weekend because I but folks, I'm in the middle of two things. We're re finishing the SQL, introducing Microsoft SQL Server 2016 book, which is going to be released next week. So I have Yay. to finish that book first. I'm on a hook for that. And I've got a course that I'm finishing uh, on another topic um, on Power BI for Pluralsight that also is due June 1. So I've got all this stuff on me. So as soon as I get those things done, which will be this week, I promise I'll get this blog post done with those articles. All right. Great. Um, next one. It says, data mining has only been available in the SAS multidimensional cubes and not tabular. Not sure if they missed it, but will it be, will data mining become available in tabular? I'd be very surprised if it was. I mean, I haven't heard anything one way or the other, but I mean, I can tell you, certainly not in SQL 2016, because we, we have that product, at least in the release candidate version, and it's not changed. But the data mining engine, um, just I don't know architecturally why it's embedded with multi-dimension. There's prob probably some reason um, why it couldn't be separated out, but traditionally they've just been packaged together, and I just don't see that coming out separately. I, I just can't imagine that, but so not not in this release, that's for sure. Okay, um, it says, how should a DBA, um, oh, I have to read, I, okay, so how do you prepare to support R in 2016 and what all should you know? That sounds kind of like a really big answer would be coming for that one. <laughs> well, it's not that difficult to install. I mean, the good news is, um, well, let me tell you, the Introducing SQL Server 2016 book that I just mentioned, it's a free book, by the way, that you can download. Just watch for it next week. You could, you could do a search, just Introducing Microsoft SQL Server 2016. It's from Microsoft Press. They'll make it available as an e-book in a variety of formats. And I have uh, one of the chapters I talk about how to get configured for our services and that's one of the things I need to do today is rewrite that chapter because what they had in CTP whatever maybe it was two I uh, two or three I don't remember which now but there was one thing you had to do and all the gyrations you had to go through in order to uh, to implement that uh, with the with RC3 and of course with RTM it's much much simpler it's a very straightforward installation process um, there I have some links in that chapter about where to get more information, but in a nutshell, uh, everything you do on the server is going to be just fine. It installs all of the, the libraries and packages that you need, and um, basically from a production point of view, what I showed you was just using R inside of, inside of the R Studio and, uh, and Power BI, but from a production point of view, if you were to have somebody create R models and so forth that you want to put in production, you basically have a T-SQL store procedure wrapper in which the R uh, goes into. So I believe I have some examples of that in the book. So that would be the first place where I kind of simplify what all of the books online goes into. I kind of have it in one, one place. That would be a good place to start. And it's free. Did I say it was free? Great. <laughs> free is always good. It, it is good. Yes. All right. Um, let's see. How do data analytics on SAS differ from our support for SQL 2016? Did, when you say SAS, are you talking about SSAS or uh, yes. SAS as in like, you know, there is that company that does that? No. <laughs> okay. No. Thanks. Sorry. First thing that I think about. Okay. So ask me the question again so that I get my context. Okay. Oh, I scrolled past it. Hold on. Let me get back to it. Okay, how do data analytics on analysis services differ from our support in SQL 2016? Okay, well, I mean, basically, in the uh, analysis services, 
you have your data mining. So this is classic data mining decision trees, clustering, association, and various things. And so there's a whole language, DMX, data mining expression language, used there. Um, it looks sort of sequely, then that you can do select columns from, but there's certain kinds of joins and certain kinds of functions that you use that are specific to uh, the analysis services version, whereas R, um, is going to be, you know, R. And R, you can use all kinds of functions. It's an open source uh, language. So it's broader and probably in terms of skill set, in the grand scheme, R, there's probably more people in the world that know R than there are people who know DMX in the world, generally speaking. So I, I think one of the things that I did earlier this year was a workshop where I did compare the two. I kind of took the examples that we just looked at, but I pushed them further. I did some logistic regression tests and really looked at what is the answer that each of these tools comes up with, and it was pretty similar. So I think in terms of results, you get to the same place. It's just which tools do you want to use? That's really the difference, which is where's your skill set lies, what, what do you want to support, how do you want to use this. Great, thanks. All right, we are out of time for questions. Um, thank you so much, Stacia, and our next session coming up is Jimmy May, and he's going to be talking about the enhancements of availability groups, um, always on availability groups, in SQL Server 2016. And awesome. again, thank, thank you. you for attending, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>